Hi there. Well, so Sexual Inversion by Havelock Ellis and John Addington Simmons is the edition I'll be focusing mostly on, but it um, has a checkered history which I'll tell you about. So just to be brief, Havelock Ellis, in case you haven't heard of him, uh, was a doctor who wrote about sexuality. He also wrote about many other topics in Victorian Britain and uh, Edwardian Britain. And John Addington Simmons, uh, his co-author, co was a poet, a historian, a classicist, uh, and he was also a homosexual rights activist. Sexual Inversion was first published in, was the first English medical text rather, published on homosexuality. It was published in 1897 in English, but it has a fairly checkered history. Um, the first edition was published in German actually, translated by Hans Corella in 1896 as the Contre Sexual Geschlecht, sorry, Contre Geschlecht Gefühl. But the 1897 edition, which has uh, Simmons' name on it, was published and circulated very slightly. Only six copies still exist because most of it was bought up by Simmons' family who didn't like the fact that his reputation might be that he was homosexual and so they had them all destroyed. The next issue of the book starts to appear in uh, the Studies in the Psychology of Sex, the large uh, collection of works that Ellis produced between 1897 and 1928. And this work um, was unfortunately banned as an obscene work and tried as part of the Bedborough trial in 1898. And finally, and in this edition over here, is the one which um, was published in America by F.A. Davis and Company from uh, 1899 onwards. The edition you've got there is the 1922 third edition. Now the book is interesting uh, for us because it occupies a fairly fascinating place in the history of sexuality and in the history of psychiatry. It does two things which are interesting. Firstly, it pathologizes homosexuality in ways which um, I'm going to discuss. But secondly also, it's a very important work in the uh, decriminalization of homosexuality in England. And this sort of makes it you know, a fairly unique text because while there were other homosexual rights texts around prior to sexual inversion, this is the first one which is both published by doctors and is actually actively trying to do something politically. It medicalizes homosexuality and categorizes it amongst uh, the so-called sexual perversions, but and some of this effort amongst psychiatrists ultimately led to people trying to cure homosexuality by about the mid 20th century onwards, and there were some early attempts than that. This book is interesting because it doesn't at all try and cure homosexuality. In fact, it argues that it shouldn't be illegal at all, and this is why it's also interesting because it's of its decriminalization issue. Sodomy in England had been uh, illegal since 1538. It had a death penalty until 1861, and it wasn't actually decriminalized in England until 1967. And no, not all countries were like this. In Holland, for example, um, and all of the other countries that adopted a Code Napoleon, from 1811, homosexuality wasn't illegal, whereas other countries which had been previous British colonies, for example, New South Wales, kept homosexuality illegal until well after that. In New South Wales, it was 1984 that it became um, legal. And some countries still haven't adopted it. It's about 76 countries currently, uh, homosexuality is illegal. So this book's sort of interesting because it's trying to uh, inter intervene in this debate about the legal situation around homosexuality and trying to use scientific evidence to sort of ch change this situation. It's interesting because this has to happen effectively, in England at least, within the fields of medicine and psychiatry. Other people who'd been trying to publish about homosexuality prior to this were either so heavily marginalised or their books were considered obscene that they weren't very effective. Whereas Ellis is trying to do this in particular ways which differ from these other texts. The other texts were often written by classicists or people with a classical education and they were trying to you know, develop concepts around uh, homosexuality that was basing it on its sort of past in ancient Greece in particular where it wasn't considered a problem and suggesting that this sort of noble uh, sort of understanding of homosexual behaviour is one that should be adopted in Victorian England. But of course most people in Victorian England didn't see it like this. Now Simmons, who is a classicist, wrote to Ellis because he wanted to sort of collaborate on a book about homosexuality. And they did uh, a lot of collaboration between 1891 and 1893. They never met. Simmons unfortunately died before the book was completed. And they were using this work in order to sort of change the legal situation in England. To understand sexual inversion though, it needs to be placed in a sort of a particular intellectual context. And that context, um, I'm going to argue here today, is uh, in the emerging field of sexology, um, which develops out of as a sort of subspecialty within medicine.
Before sexual inversion, there was quite a lot of medical writing about sex in different fields. Sometimes this touched on homosexual issues, but usually it didn't. For example, there was writing about venereal diseases, and this was mostly because of you know, the large numbers of people with syphilis in the British Army, but also lots of sort of tri attempts to control things like sex work or prostitution. And medicine, in many ways, can be seen as a form of social control here. There was a lot of discussion within forensic medicine, so people could actually you know, try and establish whether or not a sexual crime had taken place. And this focused mostly on rape when it comes to sexual issues, but also on on the issue of sodomy, and usually as a subsection at the end of any chapter on rape within a forensic medical text, there was some sort of discussions on the signs of sodomy um, which might be detected. There was also a lot of medical interest on things like masturbation. This was because throughout the second half of the 18th century, the 19th century, and well into the 20th century, people believed that this would have some sort of deleterious effect on the person masturbating, particularly that you would catch a disease called spermatorrhea. There was also a lot of discussion that you might um, form, get a form of masturbatory insanity if you masturbated too much. And this had been a part of the medical landscape since about uh, 1760 when Samuel Tissot, a Swiss physician, published a book on spermatorrhea. The interesting thing though for us with regards to sort of ideas about masturbation and the way that they link to sexual perversions is that the imagination was involved in it. So they largely this focus on a bodily practice started to frame sort of sexuality in terms of a mental process. And it raises the interesting question of why it is that it's psychiatrists who focus on sexuality when it's something that's mostly physical in the first place. They've sort of co-opted it and made it into a, a sort of a more psychological kind of issue, but there was uh, quite a lot of other approaches to sexuality which wouldn't have adopted this sort of model. Also within a related field of evolutionary biology, there was quite a lot of writing about um, so-called degeneration theory, this sort of fear that society was degenerating and that somehow this would lead to the downfall of society. The same sorts of arguments you see occasionally even appearing now in sort of codified forms. But um, this is done mostly by people like uh, Jean-Jacques Moreau in, in France or um, Henry Maudsley in England. <clears throat> None of these works are specifically sexological, but out of this sort of field that was emerging where issues to do with the physical aspects of it, the mental aspects of it, and the sort of more biological aspects, a field of sexology emerged within mostly psychiatric disciplines since about the 1870s, a little earlier than that in some places like Germany. So sexology, which Ellis's book is a part of, is a field which largely has some kind of theory of sexuality particularly it's a theory of what sexual perversions are and why they exist. It spends a lot of time demarcating and categorizing different kinds of sexual activity, for example, homosexuality being the key one that they focused on first, but there was also a lot of attention to things like sadomasochism or fetishism. These are concepts which developed amongst the sexologists uh, in the late 19th century. Some sexologists proposed uh, using hypnosis as a way of curing sexual perversions, particularly curing homosexuality, but most of them didn't and were quite happy just to categorize and explain the sort of biological background. All of these medical uh, sexological works basically had case histories as well. They had you know, some sort of small vignettes of the lives of sexual perverts that they could use in order to explain and illustrate what it was that they were talking about. And homosexuality as a sort of psychiatric problem emerges within these texts. Now that's not to say that there wasn't same-sex activity happening well before this, that's obviously true, but somehow in these texts a kind of, me the medicalization of homosexuality creates a set of cr criteria that would classify somebody as homosexual and makes them into a kind of person. And this emergence of a kind of person is quite significant. I'll have to discuss that a little bit more in a moment. Important sexologists, in case you want to chase them up, are people like Richard von Kraft Ebbing, you may have heard of him. He's a psychiatrist who wrote a book called Psychopathia Sexualis, which has like 400 case histories in it. He first used the terms of sadism and masochism as well. There's Albert Moll, who does a lot of work on child sexual development from the 1890s onwards. Uh, there's Ivan Bloch, who's a, a German uh, dermatologist, but he also focuses on the anthropology of sexual variation. There's people like Alfred Binet, who's mostly now associated with the development of the IQ test, but actually developed the concept of fetishes in the 1880s. And there's someone like Magnus Hirschfeld, who set up an institute of sexology uh, at the end of the 19th century, and who did a lot of work on homosexual uh, emancipation, but also on gender variation. And whenever you see images of books being burnt in, in Germany in the early years of the Nazi period, they're usually the sacking of Magnus Hirschfeld's library, which is being shown here. <laughs> 
So the sexologists were considered sometimes very political, although often they weren't. Often they were just operating within psychiatry generally. And between the period of 1870 roughly to about 1900, there would be approximately a thousand articles published within medical texts which discuss homosexuality and generally these are of a fairly negative nature. Havelock Ellis came on the scene at the end of this period in his book Sexual Inversion and as a part of his studies in the psychology of sex as I've mentioned and he adopts a slightly different, much more encyclopedic approach to homosexuality which tries to argue different things about it and ultimately tries to decriminalise it. So Ellis uses all sorts of material. He doesn't just rely on the sort of mm, case histories that you would find within mental asylums. He uses history, literature, as well as medicine, biology and psychiatry. He also um, does a significant amount of work in anthropology and includes lots of original cases in, his, in all of his works, all of the different uh, sort of sexual variations that he talks about. He was inspired to do this work on sexuality, partially because he had sort of some interesting sexual tastes himself. He wasn't homosexual though. But also because he'd been inspired by a sort of mystical uh, or mystic uh, sexual radical called James Hinton uh, to go and do further research on sexuality from the 1870s onwards. And actually he discovered Hinton while he was in Australia. He used to be a school teacher for four years um, in the Hunter Valley and he's went to Sydney uh, regularly in the school holidays basically to read up about sexuality as much as possible. You can find all of his notebooks in the State Library of New South Wales which he kept detailed detailed sort of in bits of the of this sort of wide ranging reading that he was doing. Because there was no really established sort of sources that you would go to to discuss uh, sexuality the way that Ellis could or you could after Ellis rather. <coughs> now one of the key things he was arguing in, this, in his works is that basically the sexual impulse is natural, that it, be, it, that it was somehow though shaped by the moral conditions where it was developing. So he was basically critical of Victorian sexual morality and this is one of the key reasons that he thought it was important to do a, a scientific study of sex so that people could actually get the facts about it rather than just relying on sort of Victorian values which had been passed down through the church and through the law and through sort of the family. He was also heavily involved in other kinds of radical politics. I'll just briefly, briefly mention those. For example, he was a founding member of the Fellowship of the New Life, which later splintered into different groups, including the Fabian Society. And he was also considered in the period to be of, um, one of the foremost feminists of, of the late 19th, early 20th century. And he was in close contact with many other feminist uh, writers like Emma Goldman, uh, Margaret Sanger, people like that. He also, uh, interesting for us I guess, uh, matriculated into the University of Sydney Medical School but he didn't study medicine here after he went back to the UK. He went to St Thomas's Hospital where he trained as a doctor, took the lowest possible qualification, didn't actually do much practice in medicine, he was occasionally a locum, but rather used his training as a doctor to afford him some kind of right to, uh, to have a voice about sexuality um, because other people who wrote about sex were often considered you know, sort of fringe lunatics or were basically banned and sometimes arrested for writing about sex. There's a lot of sexual trials in the 19th century where you can follow this sort of thing up with. <coughs> Ellis believes that sex is a natural process and because it was shaped by the moral codes um, of the society that it existed in, he wanted to try and get it beneath those moral codes and actually using a scientific and natural approach to sex somehow change Victorian sexual morality. And that's basically what he becomes famous for. Just a quick sort of overview of the sorts of ideas that come up in his 3,000 sort of page uh, studies in the psychology of sex. He emphasised that there was a lot of variation to what was normal sexuality. He suggested that sexuality existed on a spectrum and that there were certain behaviours which were sort of mild and considered normal, whereas there were others which were more extreme and started to tend towards abnormal. An example that often gets used for this is within his writing about sadomasochism. He speaks about love bites as being somehow normal, but the extreme version of them, some sort of hardcore sadistic behaviour, he would consider you know, the other end of that spectrum. But he sort of shows that they all come from the same kind of sexual impulse that all individuals have and that are shaped according to their individual psyches, the context which they grow up in, the education they had, uh, the sorts of other factors which influence sexuality. And he's sort of important here because this is much in contradiction to the sort of understanding of sex which was either you were normal or you were perverted as a sort of black and white issue. He was much more sort of sophisticated in his understanding of this. And as a result of his fairly 
positive attitude towards sexuality where he emphasized that it was natural and that it was universal, the instinct was, and that you would find it across time and in lots of different cultures, many people who identified with the kinds of categories that he was talking about would write to him detailing their sexual lives and he, they would end up ultimately being the people who would appear in his books later on. Now, as I said, Simmons wrote to Ellis because um, he'd read a review of Havelock Ellis's had written something about uh, Michelangelo, the, uh, the artist, and Ellis had actually suggested that uh, Michelangelo was homosexual. Simmons had already written a book about Michelangelo, knew full well that he was gay, but um, you know, hadn't been able to say anything about this because of the Victorian views of the time. As a result of this sort of f first hint that Michelangelo was gay, they developed this two-year correspondence. Um, I detail it all in my lovely edition of Havelock Ellis and Soren Attic and Simmons sexual inversion here. Um, and they basically go through all of the existing sexual theories, mostly the Italian stuff from Simmons, but also the German stuff from Ellis, and discuss their views around this. Simmons emphasizes, of course, the classical views of homosexuality because he's fitting it to, into a framework that fits sort of Victorian middle class respectability, where classical educations were key. And other uh, homosexual rights activists, for example, Edward Carpenter, had also used the same sort of classical view of, of sexuality. But Ellis uh, emphasized that uh, homosexuality was a natural variation, that it would be found across time, across cultures, and also across species. So you get all these little anecdotes about gay chickens or gay pigeons, and as well as people from ancient Greece and people from different tribes around the world all showing that basically this isn't something which was peculiar to the you know, British society degenerating because the cities were growing and you know, people were living in close quarters and people were drinking too much and all those usual degenerationist arguments. Instead, he was basically saying that this is something that's natural, it's normal, and it shouldn't be illegal. That's the sort of take home message from there. A bit more detail about the work. It emphasizes congenital cases, people who are born with, with homosexual tendencies, and he does this firstly by emphasizing things like their early manifestations of their sexual instinct, the kinds of dreams that they had, and also the sorts of their sort of family relations, whether or not they had, for example, gay uncles, those sorts of things. The same sorts of arguments actually still get used today in epigenetic discussions of homosexuality in some ways. Like I said, um, he enrolls in lots of historical and anthropological accounts of homosexuality. This is in order to make it not just a Victorian problem, a Victorian English problem, but actually to make it into something which is universal. Whether or not sort of gay behavior is universal, we can, always, we can discuss later maybe. In the same sort of way, he uses biological evidence to show that it's natural. And he has 33 original case histories. Six of these are women. The important things about the case histories that he uses and this is uh, true of all of Ellis's case histories, original case histories anyway, because he sometimes records other people's ones. And that is that most prior sexological writing, when it de dealt with, uh, when it had case histories in it, they were always from asylums or from prisons because the people who were writing them were psychiatrists and the sort of information they had access to were, you know, the people who were, they were treating or the people that they'd incarcerated. Ellis deliberately tried to get around that by having cases where the people had not been in prison or been in a mental asylum. And the reason for this is that he was trying to argue that not only is it something which is natural and normal and therefore shouldn't just be framed in this sort of, you know, sort of legal or uh, sort of psychiatric framework, but he also is emphasizing in his cases that the people are very cultural, they're artistic, they're often very musically accomplished, um, and they're generally sort of very uh, sort of positive people for Victorian society. This is a fairly interesting radical move um, for Ellis to be doing. This is sort of in great contradistinction to other, other psychiatrists who are writing about homosexuality at this time. And <clears throat> They're still constructed, these cases are still constructed in terms of gendered norms. For example, he'd, in, his, in an earlier book um, called Man and Woman in 1890, Ellis had suggested that there was a lot of variation between these two masculine and feminine poles, and somewhere in amongst this he would put sexual inverts, people who had adopted basically the sexual tastes of the other gender. So he's still got this polarised understanding of gender, but there's a lot of fluidity amongst all of this, and he draws on that in his sexual inversion and in many other works. He describes sadism and masochism in the same kind of gendered polarity, uh, which is fairly typical of that time. Now, Ellison Simmons both did acknowledge that 
homosexuality could be acquired, and they do have uh, discussions of um, homosexual behaviour in prisons and in, um, in amongst uh, tramps in the f German edition in particular of, the, um, of sexual inversion, but later on they sort of moved away from this and sort of pushed the congenital argument more and more. And this is because it has some sort of political value. In a context where homosexuality is legal, it's not enough just to say, well, some people might choose to do this sort of thing with their body. It becomes important to actually argue that people are born like that so you can make an argument against the law. So I'll just touch a little bit on the law um, in England at this point because the, one of the key purposes of sexual inversion was to challenge this law. So, although after 1861 there was no longer a death penalty for sodomy, which there had been, although it wasn't enacted very much throughout the 19th century. In 1889, there was a, a, the so-called Le Bouchier Amendment of the Law Amendment Act, which argued that indecent acts, or held that indecent acts, either in public or private, um, should be criminalised. Now, this wasn't just about homosexuality. It meant that bestiality would be illegal. It meant that the age of consent were raised, was raised from 12 to 16, but for, for our purposes, uh, importantly, it meant that not only was sodomy illegal, but also indecent acts was expanded to include things like mutual masturbation, fellatio, all sorts of you know, intimate behaviour between people of the same sex, or in most instances here it's between men, um, that would uh, prevent them from being able to sort of enjoy each other sexually. This is the sort of law that, uh, this was the law rather, that um, was held to persecute homosexuals in, in England until about 1967. Oscar Wilde being one of the key sort of early people who was tried under this. And this law was what Ellis and Simmons were challenging. It was also, it should be pointed out, a reaction to some sort of crisis in masculinity in the Victorian period. And it meant basically that homosexuality started to get characterised much more as effeminate, as predatory, as paedophilic, uh, as diseased as, and as degenerate, all of these sorts of tropes, which you clearly can still see in even contemporary media accounts sometimes of, of gay behaviour, starting to circulate much more in, as a part of this sort of crisis where the church sees that fewer people are coming to church, that the cities are breeding sin, all these sorts of things. The reaction, of course, is to you know, point out that the gays are at fault for this. Now, sexology is also a part of this movement, and it both uses these same sort of tropes, and it also, in some cases, like Ellis's case, it challenges them. So Ellis and Simmons, therefore, are producing a book which is one of the early instances of trying to challenge this law. They're criticising it by saying that, you know, if something is natural and normal, it shouldn't be illegal. But they're also doing so by classifying it in a way which makes it into some sort of pathological case. Now, if you jump forward a few years, this sort of pathological understanding of homosexuality, which sort of became much more entrenched within psychiatry, starts to have real effects. In the early period, it's just the sexologist classifying what kinds of behaviour there are, how it exhibited, you know, how you can find it developing in early cases in people. But by after the 1830s, people started to actively go after it and trying to cure it in some ways. If it was illegal, why was it, you know, why were people still practicing it? So they started to develop different methods for this. And ultimately by sort of the 1950s, for example, within the prison system, there were sort of conversion therapies being used, you know, where people were being, like gay men were basically being you know, put in rooms, given ap apomorphine, which makes them vomit and have diarrhea, given amphetamines, methamphetamines to keep them awake and then shown gay pornography so they associate this sort of really horrendous feeling of being left in a room with their own shit and vomit basically uh, associating that with sort of gay imagery and then being taken on like nice little dates with nurses later on. This sort of, um, this happened quite a lot across the world, these sort of conversion therapies, even though nowadays all the major psychiatric and psychological regulation bodies around the world have distanced themselves quite actively from, from conversion therapies. This is the sort of thing which uh, grew out of this sort of medico-legal understanding of, of homosexuality. And by the time you get to the 1950s, there is a big sort of panic around uh, sort of sex crimes and there's a huge effort in order to try and understand them and to, to persecute them in particular ways. In amongst all of this, of course, there was you know, the homosexual rights movement was growing and it sort of relied on people like Ellis in some ways, but not so much by the sort of post-1950s period in order to argue that, you know, homosexuality shouldn't be sort of illegal. And ultimately, this is what happened in many countries, but not all. And we still see this tension going on.
Alison Simmons' book is a significant sort of entrance into this because it offers a political stance. It's a medical book written for a political purpose, largely. All of the, the whole volume, actually, is, is one might argue is a, a fairly political text. And on the one hand, this is a good thing. The you know, medical text can be political. But on the other hand, when um, they get con when they get enrolled into this psychopathologization of uh, of homosexuality and of other kinds of sexual variation, we see that there are sort of problems which can stem from this. Um, I think it's important to appreciate Ellis and Simmons' efforts in this, but I think it's also significant that um, you know, they, they be held up and held accountable in some ways for that kind of uh, contribution. So that's Ellis and Simmons' sexual inversion. Any questions? Sorry, I could totally Google this later, but what is spermatorrhea? Uh, it's the excessive leaking of sperm. Oh, okay. Uh, caused by masturbation. Although actually it's also, it, it, it's a sort of weird, weird situation because lots of doctors in the 19th century spoke about it and treated it like it was real and actually treated people for it. They would cauterize the penis. But um, it's, it does really exist, but it's th from things like, there's a, a stimulant that people chew in East Africa called cut. Um, if you chew that too much, you actually do start sort of involuntary leaking of semen. But the idea was in the, in the Victorian period where they weren't chewing this and Kenya hadn't really been colonized, they, um, uh, it was thought that this was basically leaking away of vital fluids which would ultimately you know, undermine your you know, productivity, your manhood, your you know, ability to produce children. It would have a deleterious effect on your psyche, all of these sorts of things. But then from about the 1920s onwards, it almost disappeared from medical discourse um, when it was associated with masturbation. How old was Havelock Ellis when this was published and what, how did the rest of his career pan out? Uh, he was 38 when this version of it was published. Um, well, amazingly well, actually. I mean, he, be, he wrote 40-something well, uh, books. He wrote hundreds and hundreds of articles, um, not all about sexuality. He wrote about criminology. Health reform is one of the first people in England to propose the uh, NHS or something like the NHS. And he was an active eugenicist. I wrote a lot of sort of general works and heaps and heaps of literary criticism as well. And he managed to live off his writing quite successfully, so he did fairly, fairly well in that respect. He was a household name for a significant period. You find him in all sorts of... If you read novels from the 1930s and 40s, there are often... Characters often read Havelock Ellis to show how enlightened and advanced they are, so you sort of get a little sense of him like that. By the, even though he took the absolute minimum medical requirement, which was the licentiate of the Society of Apothecaries, um, which was basically a diploma in medicine, in order to be able to write about sexuality, at the end of his career he was nominated and accepted to be a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians. He's one of, when Freud writes about sex, he's one of the key um, people that Freud cites. He cites him, I think, second or third most out of all of the other sexologists. And he's still being cited heavily by Kinsey, Masters and Johnson, you know, lots and lots. Even now, you'll occasionally get, if people are looking at something really obscure within sexual research, you'll still sometimes get references to Havelock Ellis, even though the works are coming up to 100 years old. Yes, I think pretty successfully on the whole. <coughs> yeah, certainly within the English language, he was the most important writer about sexuality uh, at this period. Um, and you, say, you said that... Um Ellis used original case studies, mm -hmm. and six of those were of lesbians. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just wondering what conclusions he drew that may have been different to the conclusions he drew for gay men. It's a good question. Um, not a lot, actually. I mean, he doesn't emphasise the sexual parts of the lesbians as much, I would suggest. He looks much more at their effectiveness in society, their personality tropes get emphasised a little bit more. They're often very industrious women. One of them actually was his wife, the, one of the longest cases. Uh, so they're not exclusively lesbian, but there's a lot of, yeah. And then it was, I think, quite a few of her girlfriends were the other cases. It's hard to track down who these people are, largely. Um, and, but, and also, yeah, I'm not sure if that's necessarily the right thing to be doing. Interesting, though, because he emphasises different sorts of character tropes about them. So while on the one hand he's saying that, you know, there are, there are, you know, that it's a biological thing, 
He's interested in showing that the women often were successful at business or successful in the arts and these sorts of things, whereas the men were being portrayed as you know, much more sensitive kind of characters. Uh, you know, so they were being given, ultimately, different kinds of gendered tropes, which he uses to confirm their sort of sexual identity. So that's the key difference. You learn lots more about the sexual practices of men uh, in the cases than you do of the women. I mean, there's a lot, of, and you, he seems to emphasize actually the emotional aspects of the female cases much more than the male cases. But well, that's also because the cases, even though they seem to be following a sort of set of questions, because they all have the, basically the same structure, they're written often as you know, first person cases because the people are writing back to him following some sort of questionnaire. There's no copy of the questionnaire left. So in a sense, they're the same sort of case, but the sorts of things that get emphasized are you know, slightly different. There's a very good book, actually, by a colleague of mine called Chiara Beccolossi, who looks at the uh, female sexual inversion cases much more, and who um, that in relation to the Italian material. She she's does some great work on that. Hi, so uh, from a contemporary point of view, uh, can you point out some of the limitations of his views and what are some of the uh, views that are still applicable today? Thanks. Okay. I think one of the key interesting things about Ellis is that he's so, uh, so putting so much effort into trying to show that it's a biological fact homosexuality is a biological fact in this book and the other sort of so-called perversions that he looks at in the other works, he's trying to ground them in biology so much that he's sort of ultimately constructing a model for same-sex behavior which only relies on biology. And people have since done, since done a lot of research in that area. There's a lot of genetics around sexual identity, sexual orientation, um, and a lot of epigenetic, epigenetic work around this as well. And these, because they're emphasizing something about uh, the biological aspects of it, end up essentializing what homosexual behavior is. So as a result, I think that he doesn't have a very nuanced understanding of the differences between um, homosexual behavior over time, like the kinds of things that happen in ancient Greece. There's some similarities because it involves two men, but there's also significant differences to, for example, what you would find in you know, the back streets of Erskineville or something like this nowadays, right? There are very, there are different kinds of homosexuality, I would argue, um, depending on the context. And Ellis wouldn't really, he would ignore those differences and emphasize the similarities, whereas I think um, sexual behavior between people of the same sex is much more context dependent um, and doesn't have to be so um, essentialized. It's one of the key things I, would, I think that's different about him. Although a lot of people would also still argue the same kinds of things. Um, he's interesting though because he, even though he does argue that um, you know, it has different manifestations in different cultures, he's doing so to get to the essential differences, uh, essential similarities rather, and washes away these sort of surface differences. Um, his work, even though it's very ethical in the sense that he basically thinks that any behavior between people who are able to give consent um, shouldn't, be decriminal, shouldn't be criminal if it's happening in, a, um, uh, in the privacy of their own home, so no one else is going to be offended by it. He thinks that um, I th his, his ethical understanding of this isn't as developed as it would be, I think, if he was writing today. I mean, look, he was an extreme political radical for the 1890s, but by you know, the, first, the first and second decades of the 21st century, that's a little bit out of date, although not for everybody, right? Um, so, I mean, he'd still hold a, a fairly radical voice if he was writing today, I would argue, but um, yeah, he could, have, he could do a lot more with that sort of thing. He also, I think, one of the limitations of his work is that he's got a very essentialized understanding of gender. Even though he puts it on a spectrum, it's very polarized around masculine and feminine types which are narrowly constructed because they're polarized. Um, nowadays, we've got a much more, uh, sort of, much better and broader understanding of gender, um, which I think informs these sorts of things uh, significantly differently. And um, yeah, lots of his different works will obviously you know, throw up different kinds of 
similarities and differences with the present. All right, if there's no more questions, we'll wrap it up here. Please feel free to have a look at the books up here. And thank you for coming.